Hi everyone, this is Steve Genrich with UT Dallas Office of Research, uh, Associate Vice President for Innovation and Commercialization. It's great to have you here for the Lab to Launch program today. I wanna to talk about new fall 2021 programs in innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship real quick. First, as a reminder, our mission through all of these efforts, the programs, the resources, the funds that we make available, is to enable the next generation's new ventures. That's through the education, empowerment through funding and connections that we have, and then equipping you with the, uh, the equipment and needs that you have. We're uh, augmenting the programs that we've had for several years with three new programs this fall to help UT Dallas Ventures. The first of them is a seminar series we're piloting in our bioengineering area, bioengineering startup training, which we tend to extend to other STEM disciplines for research scientists and faculty at UT Dallas. The second one is the Venture Development Center Jetpack. You'll learn more about that by going to visit the VDC and watching the Jetpack video. And then there's UT Discovery. It's an award for undergraduate research students who are interested in learning about applying their research interests to real world situations by working with a venture. So hope you can Check into any of those programs or all of them and enjoy the lab to launch. Thanks. Good afternoon and welcome to Lab to Launch, the virtual series for researchers interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. My name is Enrica Ziller, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research and Innovation at the University of Texas at Dallas. As we move through today's session, I invite you to post questions into the chat for our guest speakers to address. Here to guide today's conversation and introduce our guest speaker is our host, Brent Schultz. Brent is the Director of the UT Dallas Office of Technology and Commercialization, OTC, and has been with the office since its inception in 2008. He holds an MBA with a concentration in entrepreneurship from UT Dallas and a degree in mechanical engineering from, UT, from Texas A&M University. Brent has extensive experience in IP management, new technology translation and commercialization, license and contract negotiation, business plan development, and startup mentoring. He also has experience in product ideation and development, mechanical design, manufacturing processes, and semiconductor fabrication. Brent, the mic is yours. Thank you, Enrica. Hello, my name is Brent Schultz. I'm the Senior Director of the UT Dallas Office of Technology Commercialization. The OTC manages the intellectual property portfolio of the university, and we facilitate the translation of commercially viable technologies from the lab to the marketplace. We also negotiate and execute all industry sponsored research contracts, and we oversee the operations of the Venture Development Center, which is UTD's on campus startup incubator. We are fortunate to have with us today Connie Manns, the co founder and CEO of Qualia Inc. Connie is going to share with us how Qualia and its affiliates are advancing the use of neuromodulation in clinical therapeutics using technologies developed at UT Dallas. Connie is a former material science engineer and consultant turned entrepreneur. She has a BS and a Master's of Engineering from MIT, as well as an MS from UT Dallas in Material Science and Engineering. Connie managed a two plus million dollar budget for the Advanced Pollen Research Laboratory and Center for Engineering Innovation at UT Dallas before transitioning to Qualia and its affiliates. There, she is focused on the translation of thin film softening electrode technologies to commercial applications, ranging from research tools to cochlear implants to spinal cord stimulators. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Connie. Thank you, Brent. OK, so um, as Brent mentioned, I am Connie Mann, CEO and co-founder of Qualia, um, and I'll be speaking today on working with the OTC to commercialize softening bioelectronics. So uh, first thing is Qualia is actually more of a Qualia ecosystem um, and a family of companies. We were founded in 2015 uh, and co-founded by myself and Walter Boyd, who's an associate professor in material science and engineering and mechanical engineering at UT Dallas. Um, Qualia was formed to develop uh, novel neuroscience research tools, clinical neuromodulation therapies, and gene encapsulation and delivery methods uh, through its host of affiliates. 
a lot of these technologies were developed in uh, Dr. Voigt's lab, the Advanced Polymer Research Lab, um, and the labs of his collaborators, both at UT Dallas and across the country. So our core technologies uh, and innovations focus on a group of polymers and processes that we've developed uh, to use with those polymers. Um, so we've developed a method for patterning conductive traces and electrodes onto a group of shaped memory polymers um, that soften at body temperature. Um, and we use uh, layer by layer deposition and etching processes that are common in semiconductor microfabrication. So these are the same types of processes you use uh, to manufacture computer chips, but we do this on plastics. And these plastics have been tailored uh, to be uh, suitable for use in biomedical applications. And so the first company I want to mention is Qualia Labs. Um, this company is focused on in vivo non-human research applications. So we've taken uh, these technologies and translated them to devices that can be used for animal research by the neuroscience community. Uh, you'll see our team down at the bottom. Louis Chang is our CEO and Vindia, Lisa, Tyler and Ian are our, uh, our research engineers, process engineers and sales engineers. Uh, a couple of the devices that we've commercialized uh, are shown at the top. Uh, we have nerve cuffs that wrap around various peripheral nerves, brain probes, um, which penetrate the brain. Um, and those are our key devices, but we also do additional devices such as spinal cord devices and epicortical arrays. So as I mentioned, these are electrodes that are patterned onto softening polymers. And so the benefits from that are that um, for the case of the peripheral nerves and nerve cuffs, when they soften after implantation, you can better wrap around your target nerve rather than having a set nerve cuff um, that has a specific radius that may or may not match your nerve. Here you can actually wrap very closely to the nerve. Um, with brain probes, you have a material that is stiffer for insertion so that you can actually penetrate the brain. But once it's penetrated the brain and warms up to body temperature and takes up a little bit of water, you actually have a softening effect such that the modulus of the uh, device matches the modulus of tissue better. So you get uh, less of a foreign body response and less uh, tissue strain, um, as opposed to if you had a hard silicon based device that was penetrating the brain. Um, we have off the shelf solutions such as those, the ones that you see, um, as well as custom designs. So in using photolithographic patterning, one of the benefits is that you can change designs very easily. Um, you also have a method for uh, repeatable and scalable manufacturing. So we uh, also have customers who request custom designs that we design for them. Uh, we have partnerships with Microprobes for Life Science for distribution of our cuffs and combination devices where they actually have um, their assembly methods to our nerve cuffs, as well as a partnership with Plexon to distribute our brain probes. Uh, Qualioto is the second Quali affiliate I wanted to mention. Um, congrats to the teams there. We were actually uh, just named the Big Ideas Competition Research Commercialization Track winners. Uh, so we've been really excited about that. Um, and Qualia Odo uh, is focused on improving the lives of individuals through better hearing technology. Uh, and so this company was co-founded by Walter and myself, along with Kenneth Lee, who's an associate professor uh, in otolaryngology at UT Southwestern. He's also the director of pediatric otolaryngology and director of the pediatric cochlear implant programs at Children's Medical Centers in Plano and Dallas. Um, the rest of our team, if you watched the big competition, uh, you'll know Benedict Voigt, our CFO. Um, we also have Jimin and Gerardo, who are our senior research engineers. And so the primary problem that Quali Odo deals with is deafness and hearing loss. And so over 5% of the world population has disabling hearing loss. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that after by 2050, this will be over 700 million. Um, and so for those who have uh, the most severe hearing loss, uh, cochlear implants can be a good solution for them. This is an electrode that actually goes into the cochlea in the ear and stimulates the auditory nerve directly. Um, cochlear implant sales um, have grown from 826 million to 1.8 billion in the past decade and are uh, doubling over the next decade to 3.5 billion. Um, the companies that are currently in the market for this uh, Advanced Bionics, Cochlear, and Medall are actually the only three companies in the U.S. currently, although Oticon uh, recently received its PMA approval from uh, the FDA. 
And so Quali Odo is currently partnering um, with these companies, two companies in particular, uh, to advance um, their technologies in the actual cochlear implant arrays. And so we're using shape memory polymer components and thin film cochlear electrode arrays to increase the effectiveness of the cochlear electrode, cochlear implant electrodes. And so this is either through better positioning, um, being able to hug closer to the medialis, which is the center of the cochlea where the auditory nerve is, or uh, increasing the channel count and um, the uh, density of the electrodes so that you can improve stimulatory resolution. Um, with the thinner devices and the positioning, you can also get uh, further into the ear, uh, which allows for a broader range of frequencies. Um, and the last company I wanted to mention was uh, Backstop Neural. Um, so Backstop Neural was co-founded with Jason Carmel, who is a neurologist and motor systems neuroscientist at Columbia University. Um, and Backstop Neural is focused on improving the lives of individuals with chronic pain and paralysis um, by advancing cervical spinal cord stimulation. So it's two separate uh, clinical indications currently, chronic pain and movement recovery, where chronic pain is more of the existing market for spinal cord stimulation um, and movement recovery is the emerging market. So approximately 50 million adults in the U.S. have uh, chronic pain, um, which is defined differently in different contexts, but is typically pain that lasts more than three months. Um, the technologies out there currently, um, even though it's a $78 billion market, um, the technologies really only address a certain portion of the people suffering from chronic pain. Um, with spinal cord stimulation, this is one method that's used to alleviate chronic back pain where you have leads that are actually inserted into the spinal cord in the thoracic and lumbar regions. Um, and you actually send electrical signals to either mask the pain or um, block the pain. So the global market uh, for spinal cord stimulation is about 2.4 billion growing to 4.1 by 2027. Um, this is primarily for just back pain, as we said, but our focus is extending this to neck and arm pain um, through cervical spinal cord stimulation. Uh, on the movement recovery side, you have about 5.4 million adults uh, living with paralysis in the U.S. Um, if you're just looking at neural rehabilitation markets, um, it's estimated to grow from 1.4 billion to 4.9 billion by 2028. If you're looking at motor rehabilitation as a whole in the market, um, that's over $200 billion. Um, loss of movement results from several different uh, conditions, spinal cord injury, MS, stroke, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's. Um, and there's a lot of research going on, uh, including at Dr. Carmel's uh, lab, that's showing that epidural uh, electrical stimulation can actually help recover movement. And so that is the market um, that we also want to move into. And so using kind of the same core technologies, but applying them in a different situation, um, Backstop Neural has developed a novel spinal cord stimulator lead um, for use particularly in the cervical space. And so with current state-of-the-art leads, um, there the paddle leads in particular are 1.2 to 1.4 millimeters thick silicone encapsulation, uh, encapsulated leads. And so these are stiff and they don't fit well in the cervical space. Um, backstop neurals leads, however, conform to the cord, which helps minimize lead migration so they're not moving after you implant them. Um, and we can pattern our uh, polymers anywhere from tens of microns to hundreds of microns thick. So they're narrower and allow for um, fitting into the cervical space. So here you can kind of see just two images from a human spinal cord, a uh, cadaver spine, um, where the stiff polymer actually does not conform and depresses the spinal cord, whereas ours softened to conform. So that's a little bit of what we're doing at Qualia in a few different fields. Um, so where does the OTC fit in? Um, so I've been working with the OTC now for five to six years. Um, all the technology that I just mentioned was developed at uh, UT Dallas, and so uh, I've been working with the OTC to translate that out of the university to our startups. Um, and so the first tip would be knowing the team there. Um, you will be working with them for a while. It is a process. Um, it's not just a reach out and done. Um, and they're there to help you. Um, ultimately, the OTC wants to see these technologies used. They want to see them commercialized. They want to see them helping people. And so they are there to help you. 
if you have questions, um, if you need to talk uh, about it, any of the steps in the process, um, reach out to them. Uh, the other thing is to know the process. So uh, every process will be a little different depending whether you're currently affiliated with the university, if you're a student there, if you're faculty there, or if you're not. Um, I'll be sharing a little bit more of the approach that, uh, or the process that I took um, while I was previously affiliated with the university, by the time I was doing negotiations with OTC, I was not. Um, so depending where you're at, your situation will be a little different. Um, and so first, um, not counting the research that has to be done first and the discovery, um, you have a technology disclosure uh, form. And so you can see kind of snapshots of the form on the right side. This is downloadable from the UK Dallas website. Um, and the people who submit this are actually the inventors. So I've never actually submitted a technology disclosure report. Walter and many of his uh, students and staff did. Um, and so this is when you actually tell the university you have a technology of interest, you have an invention. Um, where I came in is down here, there's the commercialization section of the form where they ask, well, who might be interested in this technology? Um, you could list if you already have connections with um, large companies, they can be listed there. Otherwise, startups, um, it could be your own startup as well. Um, and so on a few of the different technologies, Qualia was listed, at which point the OTC reached out to me to say, hey, we have this technology. They said Qualia might be interested. Are you interested? And so from there, I, if I didn't already have a non-disclosure agreement signed with the university, I signed one for the particular technologies um, just so that I could see all the information about the technology and start discussions with them. Uh, if I am interested or if you are interested, you kind of have two different routes um, initially to take an option agreement or a license agreement. And so as the name implies, the option agreement is an option to license the uh, technology in the future. Um, and so this is kind of the easier, lower commitment form <laughs> agreement. Um, there is an option fee uh, that you pay and then you commit to uh, paying for the patent prosecution costs or reimbursing the university for that. Um, this kind of gives you the option to evaluate the technology and figure out whether or not it really is something that you want to license down the road without getting into all, uh, I guess, all the discussions and requirements for the actual license agreement. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary. If you already know this is what you want to license, this is what you want to commercialize, you can move straight to the license agreement. Um, there's broadly two types of agreements that I'm aware of. There's the traditional license agreement, um, which has higher upfront costs and uh, I imagine is what larger companies deal with. Um, as you can imagine, startups tend to be very cash poor, um, at least we were. And so uh, the other startup license that UTD offers um, allows the UT system to take a uh, equity stake in your company uh, in lieu of larger startup um, fees. And so other terms that need to be negotiated as part of the license agreement, exclusivity, um, typically everyone wants an exclusive license um, and field of use that you actually need uh, for the technology. Uh, with quality, we actually ended up negotiating an all fields license such that we could then sub license to our affiliates in different fields of use. Um, so depending on what you're doing, um, you'll have to figure out what field of use you're doing uh, using the technology in. Uh, when you uh, go through the license process with the OTC, they'll request a business plan from you, milestones um, will be worked into the agreement. And this is just because the OTC wants to make sure that you're actually planning to use this uh, technology and commercialize it and that you have a plan for what you're going to do with it. Um, aside from that, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, if especially if you're still affiliated with the university, please make sure you have all your conflicts of interest taken care of ahead of time. Um, he wasn't listed on the other page, but Connor Wakeman handles that. He's great. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of forums and resources online for that too. Um, he's there to help as well. And so um, just be sure to keep that in mind so it doesn't pop up at the end and delay things. Uh, once you do have your license agreement, that's not the end. <laughs> um, you still have regular reporting requirements with the license agreement. So quarterly reporting, annual reporting um, will all be part of your process um, with the OTC. Um, 
the other side is I've kind of gone through the process for uh, licensing, but that is actually a little separate from the patent prosecution process in that you can license a non patented technology from the university or you can patent or you can license um, a technology that's anywhere along the line um, in terms of patent prosecution. So it may be uh, just an idea when you patent or when you license it. It may be a provisional patent, maybe a PCT application. Um, you could kind of be at any stage with them. Um, and so for the actual patent prosecution uh, process, um, I don't know how familiar everyone is with that. So just a little bit about that. Um, once you have a technology, you can do a provisional patent with the USPTO, which gives you about 12 months to decide whether or not you want to translate that to a non-provisional application. If you file for a PCT application with the WIPO, that extends it from a 12 month period to a 30 month period where you can decide um, whether or not to pursue patents in different countries. Um, it doesn't cover all the countries, but it's about 153, as you can kind of see shown here, highlighted in blue. So it's most of the countries that you're probably going to pursue um, protection in. Uh, with natural stage applications, um, you uh, you can choose um, to do them kind of wherever you want. So US, you can do the EU, China. Um, Quali is currently going through kind of patent prosecution in several of those countries now uh, with the OTC. Uh, eventually, uh, after kind of months and uh, years of discussions with these different uh, patent offices, hopefully you'll have an issued patent. Um, in between, you may have to restrict or elect certain claims. You have office actions that you have to respond to. Um, you have, uh, uh, if they reject your claims, you have to argue against that. Um, there is a lot of steps along the way, and the OTC helps with all of those. Um, the OTC is actually the ones who uh, select what law firm you work with for filing the provisional applications. They have, I think, a host of companies that they work with. Um, or law firms that they work with. And uh, if you have preferences, you can express those preferences with the OTC and they're happy to work with you on that. Um, once the patents are issued, uh, that's not the end of it either. There's still ongoing maintenance fees. Um, and so kind of the two sides of this to remember is that the patent prosecution takes quite a while or it can. Um, we have provisional patents that we filed in 2016 with non-provisionals in 2017 that were finally issued in 2019, but still have divisionals ongoing and uh, applications in other countries ongoing. And so um, it is a process and every stage of the process uh, requires money. So that's the other thing to remember. Um, patent, uh, the provisional, the PCT, the national stage applications, each of those can cost probably five to 10,000 or five to 15,000 um, per, I guess, application and per stage. And so that's something good to keep in mind as well. Um, all of this though uh, does happen with the help of the OTC. So it's not just you going off. Um, the uh, law firms will email the OTC along with you um, every step of the way to see kind of what you want to do in terms of what uh, countries you want to pursue protection in and um, how you want to respond to the office actions. Um, and again, the OTC is there to help um, kind of as little or as much as you want. I would uh, suggest as much <laughs> help as you can get. Um, and so that has been kind of my experience with the OTC. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Great. Well, thank you very much, Connie. That was that was excellent information. Um, Looks like we did. Uh, we have a question from the audience. We could just jump into the questions section now. Uh, prior to pushing technology out to companies, is it safe to assume that the device has received FDA approvals and the like? I guess I, I could, Connie, you could speak to it, but I'll, I'll mention that it's, uh, in my experience, it's highly, highly unlikely that a technology would receive FDA approval before it's licensed out. University stage technologies are very, very, very early, and uh, the FDA approval, FDA approval process is uh, typically done through a commercial entity because there are clinical trials involved and that sort of thing. So 
Um, so Connie, did you have any anything to add to that question? Um, no, I mean, I would agree. The, the FDA approval process is long, is expensive, um, so it's usually taken on by companies. Exactly, exactly. Well, um, so congratulations again to Qualia Odo for your very recent win, Big Idea Competition. So that is very exciting. Um, so how do you think that winning the 2021 Big Idea Competition will impact Qualia Odo? Uh, well, uh, non-dilutive equity is always a plus. Um, we are actually going through our Series C day raise there. Um, if there are any in interested investors out there, you can uh, reach out to Benedict on that. But um, I think especially with the type of technologies we're pushing forward, um, it does require expensive equipment. It does require expensive materials. Um, and so those costs add up. Um, there's one precious metal that we deal with. I think the cost has uh, gone up tenfold in the past uh, year or two. Um, it's back down maybe to six times the original cost a few years ago, um, but all those costs add up and having the extra 100K definitely goes a long way um, in supporting that. Additionally, legal costs, accounting costs, um, yeah. Great, great. And so what, what do you think, what was the most challenging part or what were, what were some of the challenges you experienced in preparing for and competing in the BIC? Um, so even though I'm more on the business side, I still tend to be technically focused. And so the big competition, one, you really have to look at it from a different point of view because you're not selling people on the technology necessarily. You're selling them on the business side of it. Um, also, there's so much information there that you tend to want to share, but you have a five minute pitch. And so you really need to reduce it down to kind of what they need to know to really get a good understanding of your idea really quickly. And that actually answers my next question, which is what advice would you give someone that is considering applying to the research track, Vic? Yeah, focusing on the business side of things, uh, you know, falling into that trap of, uh, you know, focusing on the technology. We, we, we see that a lot. Um, so any other suggestions you would give somebody? Um, I think if you're applying also, make sure that you're invested in the process. So um, they have many different ways of helping you along the road once you've kind of been selected as a finalist. Um, they had a stage presence um, workshops and several other, um, they have students who reach out uh, constantly kind of with follow up questions and everything. And so if you're actually invested and spend the time to go to these things and um, hear from the mentors that ha they have, they can really help you. So speaking of, of Qualia Inc, it's a it's a unique structure and the, the Qualia Inc is, is mostly a holding company and then you have affiliates right like you mentioned in your presentation under Qualia Inc. Uh, even though the, the technologies are kind of shared between the different affiliates and can you speak to the, the decision for how to structure Qualia like that as opposed to just doing everything in one company? Sure. Um, I could potentially blame Walter for having too many ideas, uh, but I think uh, the reason we structured it that way was that really a lot of the technologies we developed um, are core technologies that can be applied in many different ways. Um, the thing is, if they're all in one company, though, you have to focus on one thing, which is good, but it's challenging in that a lot of these were developed with people who started out as academic collaborators uh, with Walter. And if you're saying, hey, we have this, we want to push it forward for X, many of the other people wanted to push it forward in other places that they saw um, needs. And so because we have all these uh, clinicians that we've partnered with, it really made more sense to have them as separate companies where each one could push forward what they really cared about, whether that was chronic pain and movement recovery or deafness or um, GI system disorders. Um, and it just it worked better for us, even though I know it's been quite a um, complicated situation to deal with for the OTC. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made it work. It was definitely a creative solution, but it worked out well. So um, so what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced or unexpected uh, challenges that you faced on the commercialization path and how did you address those? Um, so I think 
funding is always one of the difficult first and foremost challenges. Um, it you frequently fall into a chicken and egg problem with funding because you want to hire someone and build the team uh, to push forward and to go through your raises. But to do that, you have to have money to pay them. Um, you want to go apply for grants, even if they're small business grants, but you have to have preliminary research um, done so that you can add that to your grant submissions. And so there's always kind of a difficulty of like, you want to have some starting funds. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to have had kind of a friends and family early investment um, in 2016 that has helped cover some of the things that grants don't cover as well as um, some of those other costs to help start building out the team. Um, and so that has been helpful for us. Um, the other thing I would say is the big ideas competition. I mean, especially with the research commercialization track um, that I feel like is to help companies kind of in that situation where you need a little bit of capital to really get to the point where you can raise more capital. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, that the uh, the big IP competition award for research track companies, it, it's a, 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 a significant award. It's not incidental. So, um, so speaking of, you know, going out and doing fundraising, what makes for a compelling investor pitch deck? Oh, let's see. Um, I think we kind of touched on it a few different times. It's not so much your your technology has to be sound, but it's really not uh, kind of all about the technology when you're doing the pitch deck. It's about the business side. You have to show that there is a market for it um, and that you've thought through kind of the at least in my case, the regulatory path um, and the existing competition and really what innovation and what advantage you're bringing um, to the market and showing that you have um, the plans, the strategy, the milestones, um, that you know where you're going with this money. Um, I think that's also important. OK, and we have another audience question. How did you develop your external partnerships? Um, some of those came actually from the university, um, just collaborations of projects with other um, other professors. Um, some of the partnerships have come from them. Um, so a lot of times uh, clinicians can be consultants with uh, companies in the medical device industry. That's one way of um, having the partnerships. I think a lot of actually UTD professors are very good about having partnerships with companies in the area. Um, and so some of those kind of form and then grow as uh, the companies want to deal with startups rather than the university sometimes. Um, otherwise, uh, conferences, um, giving talks at conferences, meeting people at conferences. Um, it's I think just a lot of networking and being willing to go out there and talk to people, which I will admit I'm not the best, but I have great people on my team that are good at that. <laughs> OK, and uh, do you have or have you had a mentor? And if so, can you speak to that experience? And what is your advice to those seeking mentors? Um, I've had mentors on the research side along the way. Um, if we're talking about the startup and business side, uh, funny enough, I'd have to say Walter. Um, he was my graduate school advisor at UT Dallas um, before we got pulled in. Um, he is still my boss at some places and we're colleagues at other places. Um, but in some sense, uh, if you know both of us, you know we're very different and have very different personalities. Uh, but with that, it's been nice to see because he uh, helps me to see the bigger picture a lot of times with things. Um, he's always been very encouraging in terms of being more confident at times that I was able to do things that I might not have thought I was able to. Um, and also, uh, while he's a professor, he's currently on sabbatical and he actually recently um, sold off another startup, uh, Adaptive 3D Technologies to Desktop Metal, um, a public company earlier this year. And so in some ways, even though he's involved in quality, he's also a step ahead on the startup side with Adaptive. And so that's been um, good to be able to see. And in terms of looking for mentors, um, I believe there are now programs through the IIE and VDC um, for mentorship. Um, 
And again, I think the opportunities are out there, but you have to take the initiative to look for them. Absolutely, yeah. A, a plug for the Blackstone Launchpad. We have the venture mentoring service that pairs business mentors with uh, entrepreneurial students and, and faculty and, and people looking for mentors there. Let's see, another uh, audience question. Uh, how long is an approved patent valid? Uh, so the answer there, generally speaking, is 20 years in the US. Upon expiration, what takes uh, place with the device? Uh, so when a patent expires, then it is that technology is free to use to anyone. That that's the that that's kind of the deal you get with the government when you receive a patent. You're receiving a fixed term monopoly on that technology in exchange for teaching uh, the rest of the world how to use it. So once the patent expires, then it's free for everybody to use. Uh, are others able to replicate and sell at a reduced cost? Um, so once it's expired, like I said, uh, anybody can use it uh, for free. Another question, is it preferred to have US patent approval prior to overseas approval requests, or do you recommend doing this concurrently? So that's that's done concurrently. Uh, the timing uh, and, and the rules work out that you wouldn't be able to get uh, an issued US patent and then after the fact go apply for a foreign patent. It, it doesn't work that way, so it would have to be done concurrently. Um, let's see, so I, one last question for you, just kind of a, taking a step back, kind of a broader high level question. What is your long term vision for Qualia? Um, long term, uh, mainly I just hope to see essentially Qualia's technologies and devices out there in the market through its affiliates, um, whether directly through the affiliates or through partnerships with other companies. Um, I mean, we we have this vision of expanding the use of neuromodulation in clinical applications, um, and I think it could be a very effective way of providing therapeutics that are not biologics and not drugs. Um, long term, Qualia Inc. hopefully will just be a holding company and the various affiliates I'm hoping um, I mean, I don't have set exit paths for each one. Um, acquisitions would be great. Um, IPOs are uh, tougher and harder to deal with. Um, uh, and we probably will have to bring on more experienced teams for some of those. But um, the main thing is just to see the technologies commercialized um, with medical devices. I mean, a lot are required. I mean, there's a reason there's only a handful in each of these. And with some of them, I mean, licensing out in um, being acquired is fine. We're we're happy not to be the next cochlear implant company at Qualiodo. Uh, we're happy to partner with the existing ones to get the technologies out there. So. Okay. Well, uh, looks like that uh, we don't have any more questions. So, so Connie, I just want to thank you so much for your participation today, and uh, it was a great presentation. And congratulations on all the great work you're doing there at Qualia. And uh, and it just as a personal note, it's, it's been a pleasure to work with you. So um, thank you. Same as well. And thank you for all the support that the OTC has provided over um, several years <laughs> and several well. years to come. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So all right, with that, uh, we'll hand it off to Enrica. Thank you, Connie, for sharing your time and giving us some unique insights uh, to what it's like to work with the OTC. Um, and audience, thank you for joining us today. We would appreciate any feedback you might have about Lab to Launch. Please click through the survey link found in the Q&A chat to share your thoughts with us. And to view a full list of the Office of Research and Innovation events, including these coming up in the next week, please visit utd.link slash research calendar. Thank you and have a great afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UT Dallas Venture Development Center. Innovation starts here. The Office of Research and Innovation designed the VDC in 2011 as an incubator to assist students, faculty, staff, and alumni to commercialize their ideas and inventions. This is done through targeted one-to-one -one support, 
enabling ventures to identify and build relationships with key industry partners, investors, entrepreneurs, and others to help them succeed. The VDC offers 20,000 square feet of dedicated office, lab, and meeting space, as well as shared business services and equipment. We help companies build out their teams, protect their intellectual property, and connect with expert advisors. We work to get minimum viable products into customers' hands and prove a viable, scalable business model. For startups, we help founders identify investor options, write and rehearse their company pitch, and navigate funding terms and other questions. For researchers and inventors seeking industry connections for translational research and licensing, we help identify partners, make introductions, and identify commercialization paths including licensing agreements, IP assignments, and other contracting alternatives. The VDC, in coordination with the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, the Blackstone Launchpad, and the Office of Research and Innovation, offers VDC members the opportunity to participate in mentor networks, a variety of training programs, networking events, and student intern programs. Our other amenities include six large conference rooms, 24-7 key card access, access to additional lab equipment and instruments through our core program, telecommunications with high-speed internet and Wi-Fi access, printer, scanner, copier access, lunch room with unlimited coffee, teas, and filtered water. We also have additional educational opportunities available. To become a member, companies complete a simple application and are interviewed by our innovation team. Membership is on a month-to-month -month basis and can be canceled with 30 days notice. For more information, please visit our website, venture.utdallas.edu.